Hello, friends. Lee Brown here. Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today, you get to meet one of the people who makes my mama hen heart sing, an early career realtor named Landon Pastore, who I met at an event in Eastern Michigan. And he's got a story for you and a reminder about realtor safety for those of y'all that are realtors. So enjoy the conversation. He's a delight. And then after you enjoy this, go to the show notes and connect and I'll see you on the other side. I uh, I have really, really bad OCD. And if I just paint my, I painted my entire basement black. That way it was just like, I can hone in and just focus on a screen instead of like, it makes it just like a little bit easier for my ambiance, if you will. So you know what I'm talking about, right? Do you watch The Office? No, but I, one of my best friends is like obsessed. So I've seen, I've seen plenty of clips. I get plenty of the office references, but I have, I haven't deep dove into the office yet. That's in season three where Michael thinks he's getting a job in New York. He makes the white, he's going to leave. Yeah. White paints the office black to intimidate his inferiors. <laughs> and so then Michael comes back and says, what have you done? And, and he's like, <laughs> it just, it kind of goes with your whole vibe, but I'll take that. I don't mind being the one that's the light and you can be the dark because that's, that's fair. a great balance here. But it's a good contrast. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. So now that you have shown up on crazy shit in real estate and all of my viewers are like, who is this man in the dark with a nose ring and headphones? And he's younger <laughs> than you are. I know, right? So I'm like the, the Cougar podcast host yeah. today. So Landon Pastore, tell them where you're located, a little about yourself. Give us the inside baseball. Yeah, so I um, I joined real estate in the uh, in the middle of the pandemic, which was a uh, a wild time. I joined in the East Central Market of uh, of Michigan. Um, I uh, I've been in since uh, last April, so it's been uh, about nine months now um, that I've been uh, that I've been operating, and it's it's been oh, a well, it's your baby. Oh, I, I I certainly am a a little baby in the in, in the real estate world. Um, but uh, it's been going really really well. Um, in my first year. I threw up uh, uh, just under two and a half million um, in in sales, and in our market, that's that's pretty uh, uh, that that's pretty on par for uh, for a great year. Yeah. So. Yeah. So for our listeners that are in the Bay Area and are thinking that's a teardown. House. Yeah, that's two houses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in Michigan, what's your average price point? Would you say for a house three hundred fifty? Uh, our average price point in in Genesee County is about uh, I think it's one hundred and ten thousand. Um, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, my brokerage, our average price point, uh, is 220,000. We just had a meeting about that the other day, um, which was really, really good. Um, but, uh, yeah, so last year I sold, uh, 11 houses and this year we are, uh, we are on track to, uh, to surpass that by plenty. And for the record, if you did not know, because we have almost 1.6 million realtors in the country, the average realtor sells around eight houses a year. So Landon, in less than 12 months, you have outsold the average realtor. So high five. Thank but you so much. I that's a that. big deal. And it also yeah. means you've landed in a profession that seems to resonate with you. And I'd yeah. love to know, I mean, you're obviously in the younger part of your life. So what mm -hmm. attracted you to real estate as a career it's often not thought about by younger people because being a commission field, it's very hard to pay your bills when you're commission only, especially with a large ticket item. So yeah. who, who got you started and, and who kept, kept you going? And give us a little bit of insight on that because it's, it's, I find a lot of people would love to do this business. They're scared out of their minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my... um my love for all things business came from my mother. I have to hand that to her a hundred percent. Um, she is a, uh, she's a rock star when it came to, uh, uh, any point in time in life where it was like, Hey, we have some bills to pay. Uh, she, she made it happen no matter what. And it was a very deep rooted entrepreneurial spirit that she definitely got from my grandfather. Um, but, uh, she would go out and she would, she would buy furniture for 20, 30, $40 at, at some estate sale or uh, a VOA or, or something of the sorts. And, uh, and she would redo it and then sell it for 10, 20, 30 times the price. And it, it was ridiculous. It would blow my mind. And, uh, one day she, uh, we went to an estate sale together and she wanted to buy this old Airstream that was like caving in on itself. And, uh, and she was like, no, we're going to buy it. We're going to redo it together and we're going to sell it. We're going to make a bunch of money. And I was like, mom, you're insane. This is never going to work. We know nothing about this. We can't do this. And, uh, and she said, we'll figure out a way. So, um, 
uh, given that fast forward, uh, two and a half years. And I had, uh, uh, my own business called, uh, ageless restoration and I was restoring vintage campers. Um, and we did, wait, 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 wait. Yep. this one Airstream turned uh-huh. into the whole business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We sold, uh, we restored 26 campers in the course of two and a half years. Okay. So wait a minute. How I, I hate the rabbit trail on this. Mm-hmm. How does an Airstream collapse in? Was it rust or was it, people it was, like- and what happened? Yeah, so it, it just wasn't taken care of well, and it was just kind of parked behind the barn, uh, back in the trees, and it just over the years, just rain and snow. Snow is the big one up here. We we get we get so much snow that it's like the roofs of those things they they can't take the weight, so they'll start to every year they sag a little bit more. Um, but yeah, from there, what you buy it for what you sell it for. I mean, I'm gonna sound like Shark Tank now. So what was your yeah. Problem? So, so our, our, our cost on that one, I believe it was like $1,200 and we ended up selling it for, I think it was like seven or 8,000. Um, and that was, that was end over end with pretty much every one of them. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, I was 18, 19 year old having a little bit too much money because I, I, uh, I fell into a little business with my mom. Yeah. It worked out really, really well. You do the furniture. I'll do the Airstream. Yep. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, we were. And, and the crazy thing is we were we were downtown Flint uh, at the time is where we were living. And at one point we had I mean, these are very small lots, you know, um, but we had three campers in our driveway and one in the back and the city came and they were like, hey, we got to figure something out of here. And we were like, we're just trying to make money. So um, we ended up uh, uh, we ended up just about eight months after that is when we, we stopped doing it. But, uh, so but yeah. was it in the zoning that there's a max number of airstreams you can have in your drive? <laughs> yeah, x x amount of land to x amount of airstreams. Yeah, um, no, it was. Uh, they were just saying that uh, you know it was it was a lot of work that was ebbing into the night and stuff too. So it was like uh, people were people were getting a little salty about that. But it's so funny. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> That's fascinating to me. So you sold yes. that business or you just quit doing it? Uh, I ended up just stopping. Uh, I, I just stopped like in just right when I got to low inventory, I was like, I'm going to sell these last couple and I'm going to focus on, uh, on, I clearly found out that I liked business. <laughs> and um, at that point I enrolled in uh, a community college that was stone's throw away from my house. Uh, it's called Mott Community College. I owe everything to Mott. Mott is wonderful. Um, and uh, I ended up uh they had a, they have a great program. It's a, a program with a college called Northwood. Um, and it's a business program where you do three, three years here, one year here. Um, I went for marketing and I loved it. And I, I still love marketing. And in, in my time, I, I, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do. And, and business savvy wise, my brother is a, a car salesman and a very good one at that. Oh. Um, yeah. So he was always like, Hey, sales, sales, let's, come on, let's do this. Let's, let's make, let's make big boy money. Come on, you're ready. And, and I just didn't want the car salesman lifestyle where it's, you know, 60, 70, 70 hours a week, you, you get Sundays off and that's it. I can't do it. it it's yeah. It's, it's a so lot. Real estate where you work 80 to 90 hours. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want the 50 or 60. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Hello. A hundred hours a week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah. So uh, so with that, I did actually go there and work for a little while, but the cubicle lifestyle was not for me. I just couldn't do it. Um, and this just works well with my personality because I love talking to people. Um, I, w- I was in hospitality for a very long time too. I served for a long time, which to me is like the number one thing for sales. I feel like everybody should should do 100%. that before. And um, most realtors do that at some point in their life and yeah. you learn to manage the general public. Yeah, it, it, it's just really easy to be able to bounce back from one rejections, two from just like, everyday conversation like it, it, you can you can work a conversation just in a way better manner when you've when you've talked to a couple thousand tables in the course of you know a year or two um but yeah so from there i uh i decided that i had to figure something out that was kind of a combination of office and business lifestyle but also enough where i could hang out with people and talk to people and one day uh in the middle of the pandemic me and my wife were sitting at the the table trying to figure things out and uh she works for herself too so it's kind of like we were like, hey, we got to figure a thing out here. And uh, and she said, why don't you just do real estate? You've talked about it before. Just do it. And so that night, um, uh, she went to bed because she had something she had to do the next day. And I stayed up until probably four or five in the morning. Uh, I enrolled in uh, that real estate class that we all know so well and just started blasting through it until early hours of the morning. And that was that. Do you know what I've picked up here in just this couple of minutes is, you know, the Nike slogan is just do it. Yeah. 
So often we look at that slogan and we think it's telling us that we need to tell ourselves to just do it. And what I'm hearing from you is your mom said, just do it. Your brother said, just do it. Your wife said, just do it. And so you've got this amazing cadre of people around you. They're like, come on, Landon, let's go. And how impactful is that? Because we can only push ourselves so far if somebody's not there to say, I got you, let's go. Yeah, yeah. And realistically, I mean, when you look at it from like a mental health standpoint, sometimes it's like you can be very down on yourself. And it's like it's like you can you, you, you can just, you know, you can fall into this place of like, I'm not good enough. I can't do that. I don't have the power to do that. But then when that support system around you kind of lifts you up, it, uh, it, it lifts that chin a little bit and you're able to kind of be like, OK, well, I can't do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it well. And that's and that uh, enables you to have the next conversation, yeah. with the next friend who becomes the next. Absolutely. client. So you got your license. And you dove into real estate. Now, of course, the premise of the show is the crazy shit in real yes, estate. Yes. <laughs> Nobody ever knows what to expect. Frankly, I don't ever know what to expect when I do my podcast, which is why I don't do pre-interview conversations because I don't want to have my fun spoiled. So I'd I love, love to know <laughs> in the first few minutes of what is surely going to be a long lasting professional life for you. Sure. What's the craziest moment you've encountered when you got home and you're like, you are never going to believe this. Um, my... My shell shock moment that I've had so far um, was uh, I had these two clients. They were uh, they they were young like me. We're in our mid twenties, um, and they're uh, first time home buyers. <laughs> and uh, those first time home buyers were very excited. I love working with first time home buyers. I found out very quickly. It's just it's very easy to relate to them, uh, given that I this is my first home that I've ever bought, um, and uh, we've been here two years now. So it's it, it's not that far off as far as being able to relate. Um, and I just, it's super fun to be able to see them just say, Hey, I have, I've had this dog for two years and they've never enjoyed a yard. And then being able to, that, that, that's the one that like one time really like kind of broke my heart. They had two dogs and they were like, yeah, they have a yard now. And they sent me pictures and videos and these dogs are just so excited. But, uh, I, I, I digress. Um, uh, first time home buyers that that's what, yeah, that's what your generation says, right? All the feels. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All the feels, but, um, yeah, so I had I had these first time home buyers that were uh, super excited. We put in an offer, and um, we thought like guaranteed the realtor was like hyping us up, like, "Hey, I, we think it's going to be you. We we have a couple other offers, but you guys uh, feel like the best. It's conventional offer. Uh, it's ten over asking. We're in a pretty good spot here." And then uh, last minute, some people came in and and went just over top of us. Of course, you know how this market is, and. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some some guy from California sending all of his money here for a rental, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> Not the Californians. Uh- <laughs> hey, if they've got the money, they can spend it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> You're killing us slowly. Um <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Follow Up Boss, one of the leading CRMs, client relationship managers for residential real estate, tons of top producing agents, and some of the fastest growing teams out there are using Follow Up Boss to increase lead conversion, eliminate busy work that you're not doing anyway, and frankly, deliver a higher class experience in real estate to everybody who chooses you as their realtor of choice. Follow Up Boss is going to take the names and phone numbers and also help you know what to do next so you can maintain these relationships with your neighbors because that's what this is about real estate is not about serving just prospects and clients it's about taking great care of your neighbors needs in real estate truly it's going to change your business when you start paying better attention to people they don't have to know you use follow-up boss but they'll totally understand that they are being heard by you and frankly because you're my people and we made an ask for you follow-up boss said yes you get double the free trial that's actually enough time to log in put some pieces in it and watch it change your business as it has for so many realtors and teams nationwide. Again, go to followupboss.com slash crazy to start your free trial today. But we ended up losing that one, which was, uh, it was definitely a heartbreak. They were very excited about it. You know, they're already in their head, picking out furniture, picking out colors. Yeah. So um, uh, we went back to the drawing board. And from there, it was like, we were right away in a really good spot. And it was just downhill. We ended up seeing uh, in the course of the next probably two weeks. I think we saw 15 to 20 houses and uh, they put in an offer on two more of them and they still just, it was, it was just not going their way. Oh, and uh, yeah, it, it can be, it can be really hard. And uh, uh, given that situation, I mean, it was almost, it was almost one and done. And then it's, you know, this, this now, now uh domino effect of just falling down and down. But uh, 
we ended up finding this house that they uh, they really liked in a neighboring town nearby here, uh, Grand Blank, which is a, it's a really nice area. And um, uh, we found this cute house right at the end of, end of a subdivision. It was the first house in the neighborhood. And we go there. We had seen two houses this day already. So we show up here and I was trying to like wondering where they're at. I look around and I see them in the backyard already. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, uh, I then came to find out that, uh, that there was two driveways. So there's one from the subdivision that hooks to the back. And then there's the one in the front from the main road. And the way that they went uh, kind of like around the house a little bit, there was a garage on the back. So it was like a pull through. So it was actually, it was actually a nice little feature. Um, and oh, house and lot was a pass through like, yeah. So it was like, yeah, yeah. So you, you could pull, yep. Pull in this driveway through the garage and then out through the front. So it was, it, it was definitely a unique feature, but for them, they, they entertain a lot. So it was like, they could have their driveway and then all of their friends that come over, then they can use the other one. And uh, so that was a feature that they liked. They liked the yard and we're like, okay, well let's, let's go inside. And uh, so we walk in and I, I flip the light switch and immediately we hear like this pop noise and we go, okay, well that was, that was weird. And, uh, and I, I take another step into the hallway, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a couple steps ahead of them to, you know, start hitting lights and stuff to show them how pretty the house is. And I hit the hallway light and then the kitchen light almost at the same time. And it goes pop, pop. I mean, what is, what is going on here? And it was from this closet, just like maybe three or four feet away. So I open it and the breaker box is in there. Um, but it does not have like, it's a shell of a breaker box. So it's got like the sides, no front. And all of the boxes are just sitting in there. All of the, like the, the actual breakers themselves. And every time that you would flick one, they would pop out of place. And like, it would have like a little spark. And we were like, what is, what is that happening? Like it's to code. So, yeah. So I'm trying so desperately to keep these, my clients happy. And I'm, oh, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, we have an electrician. Uh, we can figure something out. You know, of course, we'll be able to, we'll be able to find something. It's fine. And they're like, okay, well, you know, an electrician, maybe, maybe a couple of grand. We'll figure it out. And, and we can tuck that away. Let's look at the rest of the house. I go, okay, well, let's, uh, l- let's continue forward. And uh, we walk into that kitchen that I'd already turned the light on. And we look over at the, the sink. And there was, um, I don't know if you know anybody that smokes in their house, but a lot of people do it at their sink. And there was five cigarettes stacked at the side of the sink and the window was cracked open, like just like a little, just a little bit. I was like, what is like stacked, like perched on the edge so the ash would fall in the sink like that. Yeah. 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 So like already smoked cigarettes down to pretty much the filter and they're just sitting there lined up and there was some ash in the sink and the window was just barely cracked open. And so I was like, okay, well that's, that's peculiar, but you know, whatever, whatever. Some people don't clean the house all the way for, you know, it ha- it happens, you know, every once in a while. And so we keep walking through and we're talking, you know, about, uh, about cabinets and countertops and, and this is what they like. This is what they don't like. And so we continue, uh, through the dining room, which was attached to the side. It was a separate room. So we walk in there, turn on the light switch pop. Um, and <laughs> we, and it, it became kind of like a comedic reference. Like every time we walked into a room, it was just like, and yep, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, so we walk into that room and it just gets a little bit more confusing because this house is uh, vacant and uh, to our knowledge, it's vacant, but there's like a couple little pieces of furniture. So like there's a table and uh, you know, there's, there's a vase or something on the counter. And when we walk in there, the table that's sitting there doesn't have any chairs at it, but it does have three forties that are on the, on the table. One of them is like tilted over a little puddle uh, next to it. And uh and I go, okay, well, maybe, uh, maybe there were some contractors here recently and maybe they were, you know, having a couple of drinks while they were working. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge. That's totally fine. Um, and we continue then to the living room and I'm like, dude, this is not going to be the house now. Cause this is just going right down the drain. And we walk into there and, uh, there's this beautiful white painted brick, uh, fireplace. And they were super excited about it. They loved the look of it um, floor to ceiling. And they're like, Oh, we could put our, our TV would fit perfect right there. And the couch would be perfect right here. And they're, they're already now designing. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe we're good here. And, uh, uh, so they start to like, like the house still. And then we walk into the, uh, into the living room. And when we walk into the living room, there's this old beat up couch in there and it has a, uh, a sheet over it, a comforter and a pillow, but all of them look a little raggedy and out of place. Um, 
we quickly put together that we thought that maybe there was a, a yeah, squatter hanging out here. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, those things can happen. It's, uh, it's probably not a unique story here. Um, but it continues down a, 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 a bit of a path as we walk to the, uh, uh, the back rooms, we realized this house wasn't vacant. They had either left some things that they still needed to move or they purposely left them. But the two uh, girls' rooms that were at the end of the hall were just ransacked. There was um, uh, there were some holes in the wall. There was a dresser on the floor. There's clothes everywhere. Posters ripped down. Um, somebody had a, uh, a fun little time in here. And that was both of the, uh, the girls' rooms in the back. And finally, we were just like, hey, let's let's just get out of here. This is, you know with, you know, as we walk through the house, it's just getting worse and worse. So we back, walk back down the hallway, we're flicking off lights. And even as you flick them off, you're hearing the little pops come from the <laughs> yeah, pop, pop. And uh, uh, we make our way to the, uh, uh, just the far side of the kitchen where there's the, uh, the door to either the back driveway or the front driveway. And as we're, you know, doing our, uh, our little bit of conversation there, talking about the other two houses that we had seen and uh, uh, talking about potential houses in the future, that was our last house of the day. Uh, we see a a man walking up the back driveway and he's got you know a, a hoodie on and some pants and uh and i go hey let's let's just go out the front here and he sees us through it, it it's it's one of those doors that has like half glass mm -hmm. and he sees us through the glass and kind of just like oh god he has like that that is that is full on his oh shit moment and he just breaks out towards the woods in the back and uh uh he he runs away and he didn't we, come towards y'all yeah, yeah yeah that was that was we were very thankful about that. And to kind of reference uh, where we met, it's it, realtor safety is is so important and people do not take it anywhere nearly as, as serious enough. Um, you spoke about this when you were in Frank and we were talking at the Women's Council of Realtors and uh, people definitely need to, you know, be a little bit more cautious because situations like that arise. Um, e even ourselves, we should have been more cautious in that situation as soon as we seen, you know, what was potentially happening, we should have left. Um, but yeah, as far as realtor safety, it, it needs to be top of mind. Um, but we, uh, we were able to then, uh, you know, get out to our cars and we, we made way, uh, for the rest of the day. But that was, uh, that was my story of how, you know, a, a small electrical error turned into potentially having to, uh, you know, deal with a, deal with a squatter. I, after we left, I had messaged the agent and I said, Hey, um, there's something going on here. And I, I messaged her through showing time, the app that we used to, uh, uh, to do all of our showings. And then uh, I also emailed her and I never got anything back. Seriously, like not even a thank you for letting me Nothing. know. My own agents, it's not. Not a, not a single thing, so. so. I'm guessing your people didn't buy the house. They had they turned They turned that one down. Yeah, actually. They <laughs> I mean, um, it happens, right? So yeah. people can, they can talk their way through so much, but then they hit that breaking point of that this is not meant to be. And sometimes yeah controllable situations like this where you got to change the locks you got to clean the stuff out and yep. it might have been okay if they hadn't spotted the dude but yeah it could have it could have definitely been a uh you know a fine situation but yeah, i mean once we saw the guy it was kind of just like yeah all right <laughs> and obviously now we know he was a squatter because he booked it he was like out of here yeah yeah he was he, he was to the woods um but though the, those first time home buyers did buy their first home and their dogs have a beautiful yard just up the road from that house so and they probably like the house they bought even better they do they love that house yeah yep and and say, all, that's the wildest thing about real estate and you you'll find this for the rest of your career the right house always works itself out it finds and you yeah the wrong house will throw up roadblocks and it's kind of like do you read Stephen King at all? Have you read 11, 22, 63? I haven't read any Stephen King yet because I know everything kind of has like this interconnected thing. And I want to be able to kind of just, I, I don't want to do the thing where I'm like, oh, one book here, one book there. I want to kind of just like jump into Stephen King, if that makes sense. We'll see. But this one is different. It's like a super psychological one, 11, 22, 63. And I bring it up because in the, the premise of the book is this guy finds a rabbit hole back in time and he decides to stop the assassination of JFK thinking it fixes the world. But in the book, you find out history doesn't want to be changed. And so roadblocks come up. And so whenever I look at a house situation, like you're describing with your buyers, yeah, roadblocks crop up because that wasn't their house Precisely. and they had to go somewhere else. But let's do talk about realtor safety for a second, because yeah. I find our clients don't understand the risk of walking into somebody's home. Yeah. We 
as realtors don't think about it. And then we seldom explain it to the public. Like we talk about it amongst ourselves sometimes, Mm -hmm. but it's a responsibility of us to tell our clients, Hey, we're going in a vacant house today. So watch your six. I've got your six. And yeah, here's how we're going to operate. And if we see something sketch, we should head for it and I'll call somebody. 100%. So have, has that experience changed how you set up walking into a house with your buyers to have them think differently when they walk in? Do you leave more, more, so- well, it's more sooner. Do you leave sooner <laughs> now if you spot something that feels yeah. off? One of the biggest things that was kind of like an, like a weird turning point for me was uh, when we hit winter, it gets, it gets dark here so early in the winter. I mean, it, it, you're looking at sunset at like five fifteen at like our, our early nights. And uh, that was, that was one of those things where I was like, Hey, you know, I, I, I really don't want to be going uh, meeting new clients and stuff like that out in the, out in the middle of the night. Cause that's a, um, that's a big safety thing. But then additionally, you know, anytime anything kind of just like hits you the wrong way, I, I've been very quick to be like, Hey, let's, you know, um, uh, let's take a step back. Let's take a look at things and let's, uh, let's maybe move on to the next one a little bit quicker than we thought. It's definitely, uh, front of mind rather than back of mind now. Oh, I like that. Cause intuition does matter. And yeah. we, all of us as humans should listen when we have that little gut feeling so that yeah. we can stay safe. But as realtors, you want to make sure we're keeping our clients as safe as knowing that we're in an inherently dangerous business that HGTV makes it look easy and it's not easy. It's this beautiful, pretty thing. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's like, Hey, we gotta, we have to worry about people's safety. You know, thing, things do happen and, and, uh, things have happened. So that's, that's kind of the reference point there. So. And then in the meantime, we don't recommend that you smoke by the sink friends. And then if you drink a 40, sure. throw it away, just, you know, just, just common courtesy. Yeah. <laughs> so Landon, if somebody wants to meet a very, enterprising, successful early career realtor in Michigan. How can they best find you? Um, you can, you can best find me either uh, on my Instagram. I, uh, at Landon Pastori, um, that's P-A-S-T-O-R-I. Uh, I'm at the, uh, the Brokaw Group in Davison. Uh, you can find me there anytime or, uh, or you can reach out to me through email, uh, Landon at brokawgroup.com. And we will have all of Landon's contact information and handles in the show notes for this episode. Now, before you go click on it, Leave him a nice note and tell him how glad you are he became a realtor. Make nice comments. Give a thumbs up. You give me five stars and a subscribe and a bell so you can come back for more. And by the way, you want to make friends with Landon because he has great podcast suggestions. I started with 70, over 70. because Nice. Of, and it's it's like I feel all like a big mush pot. Every it's time. heartwarming, isn't it? It's like, so good. It's so good. It's so good. It's incredible. And now I'm sad because he's done recording them. So he better do something else. Yeah. Cold. A lot of old episodes. He's such a, he's a great host. And like the way he talks to all of his, he's, he's incredible. He's so well, I like his dad a whole bunch too. I'll yeah. Love his dad. So we'll also include a link to the podcast that Landon suggested to me that I'm suggesting to you because just like we get our best clients in real estate through word of mouth. So do you get great podcast and book suggestions. So if you have a friend buying or selling in Michigan, call Landon just because he's early career doesn't mean he's not hustling and doing a great job. And by Indeed. the way, extra high five to your wife, your brother, and your mom, and also your grand for giving you the support to get you going. So thank you for coming on the show and for sharing a reminder for us about real true safety and I really am I'm not thirsty for a 40 now. So thanks for that too. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, guys. We'll see you around these parts next time. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel. Turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you want to learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous. No judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.